So we'll go ahead and get started, and uh, uh, there's still some people left to uh, to join, but uh, but they'll be on, I'm sure, before we get to the meat of things. So today's webinar will be recorded. It will be available uh, uh, offline as a recorded webinar. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, type them in, and uh, we'll we'll look at the. You'll see me if I look down. That's me looking at the question mark. Um, and uh, We'll try to we'll try to answer those questions either during or at the end of, of the presentation. So, cloud-based controllers, cloud cloud is great, cloud is terrible. Yep. It all depends, and that's what we're going to talk about. And you know, for perspective, we we hear a lot from from not only Ruckus but from other other manufacturers, other vendors about controller in the cloud. And basically what we're going to talk about in terms of controller in the cloud applies to any cloud controller option, whether it's Ruckus or somebody else. Because in every case, controller in the cloud could be great or it could be a terrible decision to make. And so by way of introductions, Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, as a Ruckus employee, I want to point out that Ruckus doesn't actually have a um, released cloud offering yet. We have a cloud product in beta at the moment. You can certainly sign up on cloud.ruckuswireless.com. But as of now, we don't have a production cloud product available. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Just making sure. No, All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so I'm Joe Bardwell, Chief Scientist and President at Connect802. Uh, we've been around for over 20 years. Uh, and, and have uh, a lot of uh, traction in the, in the wireless market space. Uh, Dave, uh, do an introduction for yourself. So I'm Dave Burns. Um, I've worked in the IT space for probably about 20 years now. Um, I worked for Ruckus for the last year as a wireless systems engineer, but before that I was network manager at San Francisco Unified School District, running a re really large distributed network around San Francisco. Um, and before that I worked in financial services and a bunch of other places running large um, distributed networks. So a little bit of everything. And, and Dave and I are going to banter back and forth and, uh, and, and hopefully convey some interesting information. But uh, for perspective, uh, Connect802, like I say, we've been around for a long time. We're headquartered uh, in the Bay Area in San Ramon. We have an East Coast office in, in Tennessee and Pacific office in, uh, in Kahului, Maui in Hawaii. One of the things that we do is, is we, we can apply three-dimensional RF CAD modeling based on AutoCADs for large-scale projects uh, and, and projects that we've done uh, across the country and, and around the world uh, can benefit from that 3D CAD modeling, uh, something where, you, where it's not practical to send somebody out and do surveys for 150 buildings over a two-month period. And, and we know the landscape. We design and build out in whether it's point to point, uh, whether it's a vehicle, uh, MDU, dormitory, education, hospital. And we've been doing this uh, for, for a lot of people over a long period of time. So we definitely, uh, we, we know the space. We understand the technology intimately. There's a Hawaiian word, lokahi. It refers to a system or organization made up of different parts that don't necessarily go together automatically, but all those parts have come together to form a unified, cohesive whole. And I think about that when we think about what is a controller. Controller is a, is a, is a thing that, that has different parts to it. Parts that manage a network, control a network, monitor a network. And sometimes you hear these parts referred to as the planes, the, the, the data plane, the control plane, the management plane. And, and those are parts of any controlled environment. So when we talk about a controller, the controller, I mean, at the end of the day, it's software. And that software is running on some hardware. And what it comes down to is we consider cloud controller, local controller, 
we're really asking the question, where is the control software running? Where is the management software running? Where is the monitoring software running? Is it on a dedicated hardware platform, like a Ruckus Zone Director controller, a uh, Cisco Wireless LAN controller? Uh, or is some of the software running in the access point and some of the software is running on dedicated hardware? Or is some of the software running in a cloud, running across the Internet? But no matter how and where that software runs, there's going to be software that does control, software that manages, software that monitors the, the wireless network environment. So things to manage. I need to manage the AP transmit levels, and that means that, and, and again, this is universally true. It's not just a ruckus thing. In a, in a properly controlled commercial con, uh, controlled environment, an access point listens to the power levels of the adjacent access points. So it understands from that how the power levels should be adjusted so that an access point is neither too strong nor too weak. That doesn't always work out perfectly, but it no. starts to lay the groundwork. Dave, thoughts? No, I mean, you know, I'm just laughing because you're right. I mean, it does start to lay the groundwork. It doesn't always work perfectly, but you do need some central orchestration software that is going to be monitoring and maintaining the wireless infrastructure, right? You know, if you have five Apple Airport extremes, all, you know, room to room to room to room, like I used to see in, in the school district before we put in an enterprise solution, you know, they're all going to interfere with each other, they're all going to be doing disparate SSIDs, you know, they're all going to potentially have channel interference or, you know, be configured in one of a million different ways. So it's good to have centralized control in some capacity or another, um, whether that's run, you know, um, as, a, as a hive, as one of my competitors will do, or whether it's run on an individual AP that is the master AP for a group of APs, or if it's run in, as a control plane in the cloud somewhere. I mean, all, you know, it has to be somewhere all right. for the overarching and, system. And, and the underlying implication that we want to think about in, in today's discussion is that's an example of a case where the access point, all the access points, have to communicate back to some kind of software so that the other access points can understand what their power levels are. Every, all the access points have to be able to communicate to each other. That's the idea of communication between an access point and a controller. That we could carry the same thing, you know, the, the control software uh, uh, pushes the, the SSID and VLAN configuration into the access point so that it, it, it understands what it should be broadcasting and how it should be tagging frames coming out. Um, and, and there's another part of the discussion that's sort of uh, to the side. You, you might hear the term, and, and, and five plus years ago this was much more of a discussion, uh, the controller is in the data plane or it's out of the data plane. And, and years ago, the, the original concept of a controller was that the data traffic was tunneled from the access point back to the controller, then it came out of the controller. And that made it easy for the, that's the controller in the data plane. All the traffic goes back to the controller, comes out of the controller. And, and that, that was how it started. And, and that's really not the case in, in most controller environments today. So we don't. We never have to worry about in, in controller in the cloud. We never have to worry about does user data go back to the controller. Now that being said, it well, could. Go ahead, Dave. And I was going to say, you know, that that can be a plus and a minus, right? Because and and that's going to come up in another slide or two where we talk about really knowing your customer and knowing your network. Because, you know, certainly as as you described, you know, the controller doesn't have to be in the data plane. And increasingly, we see places where they want to tag it and they want to do local breakout for the traffic. They want to, you know, particular SSID on a particular VLAN or dynamic VLANs for all the different users. Um, but, you know, maybe you're a school district and you want a centralized place to be able to monitor all the traffic and you don't want to have to have a shim installed on every computer or, you know, know that you're going to have to have a, a content filter that's going to be watching all the VLANs. You want to only watch 
the egress of the wireless in this one particular location. Or maybe you want a walled garden for your guest users, and so you want them to egress at the DMZ rather than egressing locally on a LAN in your, your local office, right? Like maybe you have a centralized DMZ where you will want to tunnel all that traffic. So exactly. um, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but the moral of that story is kind of knowing your customer and knowing, you know, sometimes cloud, you don't need to have the, the control in the data plane, but sometimes you do want to tunnel your traffic to the data plane. So knowing the customer. Um, anyway, exactly. So. And, and as, a, as a customer, as a client, understanding what your own requirements are. When I, say customer, yeah, when I say customer, I mean, you know, knowing your own network or if you're a VAR or a hardware manufacturer, yes. knowing your customer's yes. network. But really, it means, you know, being savvy about your particular setup and the needs and requirements of your, the network that you are trying to solve this um, problem for. And, and we go on to uh, authentication. Uh, how, how am I going to do 802.1x radius or am I going to do Active Directory or LDAP? And authentication ultimately has to go back to an authentication server of some kind. So there is there is traffic. Uh, access control is the network. Uh, uh, are there firewall rules applied? Uh, does the network shut off at, at 5 p.m.? So there are aspects of network control and management that require a connection between a conversation between the access point and some kind of control device. The dog is, has a questioning look. What the heck? What, what do I need to manage? And this goes back, Dave, to what you were saying about understanding what the end user community requirements are to understand what features I need in a controller to then understand whether those features are practical and appropriate with a controller across the internet in a cloud. And, and, and that's the case for any network design, right? I mean, re requirement gathering is the number one thing that will make or break your network design. You need to Absolutely. know what the users need, and you need to know the features and functionality that you're going to require to support the things that the users need. So, you know, as you describe on this slide, right? SSID, yes. obviously, we're always going to need to be able to specify that. But, you know, maybe you're a cafe and you don't really care about 802.1x radius. Or maybe, you know, um, the reason that Joe brings that up, obviously, is because if you're going to go with a cloud solution, but you want to do um, authentication against Active Directory, you're going to need to allow that cloud provider to connect back through the Internet into your personal network, you know, whether it's your corporate network, home network, whatever it is, to access your Active Directory server. However, you know, maybe you're a Google Apps user and Gmail is hosting all of your corporate email. In that regard, you know, you're already doing web-based authentication on the Internet, so authenticating the uh, radius over from a cloud to that might not be such a big deal to you because now you're not right. going to be opening the inbound traffic and, to your, your local network. Right? And, and you touched on a real potential can of worms talking about uh, setting up firewall rules and port forwarding inbound rules to right. allow communication back the through internet I, in, right i mean absolutely we we, we encounter that uh, in the retail environment with pci compliance where uh, uh, pci will run a security scan against your ip address and and they don't want to see any holes coming back into the network they they're very uh, uh, Serious about that, right? Well, yeah, no, obviously. Very <laughs> I want them to be very, you know, very specific with my credit card data too. So I'm glad that they're very assertive about that. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So you know, those are those are things to keep in mind, right? You know, what features do you actually need? What features are going to be on offer from a given provider, whether it's cloud or physical controller or virtualized controller? You know, are those features and requirements going to be met by that particular vendor's equipment? Right, and and control features. One of the ones, uh, uh, and Dave, I know we've talked about this uh, in, in the past on different accounts, uh, the, the support, when you say game console, when I, when the bullet point is this game console support. Really, it's talking about a headless device, uh, a device where I, I don't have a web browser that I can go and go to a guest portal page, log in, and authenticate, where I have to do Mac authentication. Correct. And, and, 
and that's another piece of the of the access puzzle. Right, and, um, and there are a variety of ways to do that. Right, you know, you can do things as Joe mentioned with MAC address authentication. Um, you could just keep an open SSID and allow people on. Maybe developing, you know, providing a pre-shared key to people and telling them how to do it. Um, you know, these, these are things that are important to think about as you're as you're building this out and as you're investigating the options for your users and their connectivity and onboarding. Um, right. I could talk about onboarding all day because that's a different product that we definitely uh, are deep deep with um, in terms of Ruckus. But um, sure, and, and we see that all the time in, in the school systems and and in dormitories. Uh, where where absolutely uh, headless devices have to be allowed to connect to the network. Yes, yeah, I know it's very important, you know, especially in higher ed where people want to bring in their game consoles, they want to bring in their wireless printers, they want to bring in their well, Apple TV kind of has a has a mechanism to get on board. Um, but you know, a lot a lot of these um, similar devices to that are not as easy to configure and as easy to manage. Um, so yeah, you do need to take that into consideration and in how you're going to get those devices securely on. And as a network uh, operator, how you're going to equate those devices to one of your users, right? It's one thing to say, like, well, I have 100 Xboxes on. But it's another thing to say that, oh, this guy who is streaming this particular video and is destroying my network, that Xbox is actually owned by this particular student, and I know that it's in this dorm, um, or, you know, and, what have you. So there's got to be a mechanism to tie that stuff together, too, and that's not always on offer. What, what occurs to me, as, as you're saying, and as we're thinking about this, you know, one of the reasons that these are critical pieces is we want to then, in, in the, the question of controller in the cloud versus controller locally, uh, these are pieces where we want to ask the question, what is the required data packet flow, the management and control packets, what is the required communication between end user device, access point, authentication server, other server, uh, right. through the edge to the internet. What are the, what are the paths of communication that are re required? And will these paths of communication have suitable robustness if it's required to go out to the internet to a cloud controller and right. perform one or more of these functions? Right. And we've gotten kind of far afield from what we were originally going to be talking about today, but it's true, right? I mean, you do need to take all of that into account as you're thinking about how you're going to design this network and how you're going to be able to securely bring people's devices and, in and uh, and account yeah, for Yeah, absolutely. And, and from a practical standpoint, you draw a sort of a graphic block diagram and you start drawing arrows of where the traffic comes from and where it goes to, and then you look at where the where the uh, the critical point of failure is that would cause the network to be inoperative. Right, absolutely the case. Um, okay. So, we see that there, there are three flavors, if you will, of controller environments. Um, and and uh, we, we, we call them easy environment, a typical environment, large-scale enterprise, and the question mark implies uh, well, easy is relative, and maybe easy applies to a large-scale enterprise. It's, it's not a hard and fast set of rules, but the, the, the easiest thing is, is typically a, an environment a, in a public cloud. Absolutely the case. You, know, you, you sign up for an account, you buy an AP, you, you plug that AP into your dashboard, and it's pretty much off you go, right? You know, as long as there's an available network drop, um, you know, there, there might be some functionality that you can do or you might be able to, you know, assign VLANs for a given SSID or um, manage some, you know, application recognition, things like that. But by and large, they, they, uh, they might not be as feature rich as a traditional controller environment. Um, I should go by the slide though. So easy setup, easy to automatically provision APs. Um, when, we, when we talk about the CapEx and the OpEx, right, um, and we're going to talk about that on every one of these slides, obviously. Um, but for for this, and, and this is, you know, grain of sand, this is, or grain of salt, this is our opinion of where these are, right? I mean, these aren't hard and fast numbers, obviously, because there are no numbers. But my opinion would be that for a cloud offering, a CapEx is considered low because you're not actually buying the controller. You're doing a one-time purchase of an access point. But then your OpEx, in my opinion, is medium because you're going to be paying a subscription fee to this cloud provider in an ongoing, you know, format for however long. 
um, to continue to manage and maintain this cloud-based wireless network. And, and just to level set, um, you know, we, we've been, we, we're talking about cloud and there's a couple of different ways to talk about public cloud, right? When I'm talking about cloud, and Joe, I, I'm assuming, is also talking about cloud, we're talking about like enterprise level cloud, um, not to name companies, but like the Meraki's, what Ruckus will ultimately be offering, things of that nature. Um, there are open source cloud opportunities. There's something called Open Mesh. There's another company called Cucumber Tony. Essentially, they overwrite the existing firmware on open source APs to run like a Hive cloud controller. That is a different can of worms. It's, I'm not saying that it's not a, an applicable, you know, it's not a reasonable technology. It's pretty cool. Um, but it's not something that necessarily is what we're talking about today, let's say. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, to me, the underlying aspect is support. Right. Uh, to, our, to our last bullet point, right? It's great for customers with little or no expertise. Open right. Mesh and Cucumber Tony is the opposite of that. It's right. great for customers who have a lot of expertise and who want to use a cloud, but who don't necessarily want to pay for an enterprise level um, cloud offering. And my apologies to the Open Mesh and the Cucumber Tony users. In no way am I sliding your product or what you guys are doing. It's just a, to me, it's a different thing. You, you have to be you have to be uh, an experienced uh, uh, networking person to to yes. to flash an AP with uh, with third party code and and implement uh, a, a network where you are the the support for it, basically. Absolutely the case. It's um, like they say in, in, in the aviation world, they say if you, you know, that there are there are load limits and speed, you know, uh, 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 speed limits and there are limitations on aircraft, and if you decide that you're going to exceed those limitations, you become the test pilot. And and the same is true with, with anything that is not an off-the-shelf manufacturer's offering. You become the IT support group. You become the developer. You and and if you have that skill set and you want to do that, that could be a great cost-effective way of doing it. But it's right. certainly not for everybody. Right. And and so and the reason that I bring that up is because to our point, you know, we're kind of saying that public cloud is is a product because it's meant to be easy, right? Like there's a reason that Meraki is so huge in the space. It is meant to be easy to do. It's meant to be easy to deploy, easy to manage, um, you know, easy to support. Um, maybe not as feature rich as somebody else's, you know, I mean, within the same company at Meraki, you know, the WLC is definitely much more feature rich when it comes from Cisco than the Meraki cloud offering is, um, but they have both flavors because they know that there are multiple types of customers. Right, right. So, and, and what you were saying before, Dave, uh, uh, CapEx versus OpEx, the, the upfront capital expense on a cloud, on a, on a, on a public cloud could be less but always do the math absolutely the case <laughs> because if, if, if there's a let's say there's an uptick cost per AP cost for subscription to the cloud well there there's a point at which you know if, if, if I'm putting in 12,000 access points across a multi-campus corporate environment and that is not I mean, that's a large number but it's a it's it's a it's a large enterprise number. It's well, not unheard of. It, absolutely, and, and and so there is a point at which spending X dollars, whether it's twenty five hundred dollars or forty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars on controller hardware to have a local controller, there's a point at which the, there's a break even on that. There's a point at which he, he should have just bought a controller rather than paying the subscription for the cloud for such a large large-scale environment, maybe. Maybe, maybe you're, right. it's a large-scale environment because it's spread out in, 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 in 150 sites across the country. Uh, a a fast food restaurant is an example of that. Um, but the other, the other CapEx versus OpEx, and let me, let me go to the controller slide, where, where we talk about it is a higher CapEx. You're buying a controller up front. The other thing that you always encounter is, even if it's if it's if it's 
12 access points and a, and a $3,000 controller. Uh, if you're in the cloud and you're paying X dollars per month or per year per access point, there's going to be a point, three to five years maybe, somewhere down the line, where what you have paid in subscription fees for your access points equals and then exceeds what you would have paid for the controller if you'd bought it on day one. That assumes that you had staff on hand that could manage the controller from day one. Maybe you don't, in which case the fact that after five years you pay more is really irrelevant because you didn't have to hire staff. The expertise is, is very important in that regard, right? I mean, there is something to be said for, you know, the, the reason that the public cloud is so easy to use is because there's somebody else that's managing it, there's somebody else that's patching it, there's somebody else that's making sure that any security vulnerabilities are addressed. You know, you get an email that says, hey, the, the management interface is going down for the next four hours, and when it comes back up, there's going to be all kinds of new bells and whistles that we put into it. That's not you taking a backup snapshot of your network and then making sure that it comes back up and that all the APs came back online. That's you calling the, the company and saying, hey, you just you just flashed it, and three of my APs are on, and the fourth one's not. Like, right. make it work. Um, right. And that's, you know, that that's another thing. You... you, you it's good and bad. You also put your eggs in that person's basket, and then you say, hey, you know, one of the APs didn't work, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we just upgraded 5,000 APs, and you lost one. That's unfortunate. We'll RMA it when we get a chance to it. So well, and, all, and the other you know, piece, all things must be taken into consideration. Yes, 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 which is, which is why the theme here is cloud is great, cloud is terrible. It all depends. Absolutely. The other piece, the, the other piece of that is that there is a life cycle to consider. And so, so every three to five years, I mean, we look back as, uh, as 11G became 11N, became 11AC, and coming next is 11AX uh, with four times the throughput per client. See, 11AC provided greater capacity in the coverage cell, but not dramatically greater throughput per user. A little bit, but not dramatically. 11AX, dramatically greater throughput per user. Yes. Uh, we should start seeing that maybe in, in 2017. We'll start seeing some of the precursors to AX. If you have an environment where you are generally keeping pace with the best highest capacity, greatest throughput uh, equipment, then every, every three years or so, there's new, there, there's new user equipment. On the other hand, if, if you are, let's say, a school district and you have a cart with notebook computers on it that you roll around for the classes to use, and those notebook computers, gosh, maybe the complaint is, All right, these notebook computers are seven years old. And they're still 802.11G. Uh, so you look at when we say, I want to know how long it's going to take before my subscription service equals the cost of a controller. In that consideration, I also want to know how long it's going to take before I need to do a forklift upgrade on my access point hardware on the wall. And that will vary between what a, uh, what, a, what a corporate enterprise might do versus what a school might do versus what a retail store might do uh, versus what your own personal view of the world is as to how, how much you want to hang on to legacy and how much you want. Or, uh, Dave, you were saying something to me exactly. the other day about warehouse space. Yes. So we do, I mean, you know, not to... I mean, we are totally going off the rails at this point. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we do plenty of warehouse space. Um, you know, wireless is important, right? Everybody has a scan gun. But the amazing thing to me is that, you know, when you talk about how large a typical warehouse environment would be and how many warehouses are usually owned in that sector, you know, the scan guns are two, $3,000 a piece, and they have 500 of them. They're not looking to replace those until they absolutely have to. Um, so, you know, I go into warehouses all the time and we want to talk to them about AC and how great our new APs are and they want to talk about how great my 2.4 gigahertz coverage is for 802.11b devices because that's still what they're using 
and they don't intend to upgrade anytime soon. Um, you know, and, so and I mean, that, knowing your customer and knowing your network, right? I mean, as you were describing it, you know, so much of what you talked about is pretty much you are always going to be at the whim of the lowest capacity client that you have on your network. So, you know, knowing the clients that you have to support is going to be half the battle, right? If you know that you have to support 802.11b clients, that's going to that's going to send your design in one direction. If you know that everybody's going to have the latest and greatest, and it's practically greenfield, then that's going to send you in a different direction. And and let me pull this back to the to the to, to the core of what we're talking about. If I know that the client devices are not basically going to change over a five to seven year period, then I might not be as interested in a cloud based solution because I know after three to five years I might cross the point where the controller would have been a much less expensive option if I bought it up front. So increasing the capex on a long term implementation well, might be good. And I was going to say it's also interesting too, right, because I Again, not to get into the well to get into the capex versus opex thing. I find that a lot of smaller companies feel that it's a, a good idea to move money from capex expenditures to opex expenditures because it looks more like oh well these are things that we would be able to cut should we need to lower our expenses. But the reality is, if you're moving infrastructure services to opex, you'll never cut those. You can't ever cut those. That's what your business is running on. So. In a sense, it can make sense because it looks like there's a way to mitigate costs at a certain point. Oh, you know, we're not going to have to depreciate this. You know, we can just sign up for a different subscription or cancel this anytime we need to save a little bit of money. Well, yeah, but how are your developers going to develop if they can't get on the internet? Like, they're not. So, you know, I, I my concern, and this is this is hardware provider agnostic for me personally. My concern is getting locked into that scenario. Um, unless you are a business that isn't dependent on your network connectivity for your business. Because right. I would hate to go down the line, and this is with any company, you know, I would hate to say, oh, great, you know, I have this one-year subscription model where I'm paying 10 bucks a month. Oh, next year they asked for 100 bucks a month. Uh, now I either have to find a new provider or I have to rip and replace all the stuff that I've been using. I didn't think I had to go through this again. But right. here we are, back to negotiating and back to going back through it again. Um, right. So yeah, knowing and, knowing your business and knowing how to how to segment that out is important, I suspect. And I think on this slide, the reason we we've we've tagged this as typical is because that is probably the most typical implementation today that's out there. There's a physical controller whether it's a ruckus zone director or a Cisco wireless LAN controller or, or an Aruba controller, or uh, that is probably the most common, most typical implementation. It implies that there are some knowledgeable people on staff that can, that can manage and, and, and run the controller. It implies that there's uh, a rack somewhere that the controller can live in or, or a closet that the controller can live in. That's the most typical, yep. and and that's where all the features are. In the in the the most features are in the hardware controller. It does seem to be but, the case, <laughs> but maybe not. You could take those same features, and you could in some cases you can license the controller software. And here what we're doing is we're saying let's separate the dedicated hardware. Let's take a, take a ruckus zone director. What is it? it it's a, it's a, a, a customized computer in a, in, a, in a chassis with some code running on it. They call it the zone director. It's software and hardware. Well, if you take that same software and you run it under, under a virtual machine in a VMware environment or in a Linux environment, you have the same feature set, but now the reason we say this is for large-scale enterprise is there's a lot of moving parts. Absolutely the case. You, you have to have somebody who already understands virtualization. You need to have a virtual infrastructure in place to actually be able to run these virtual machines on. Um, but having said that, you know, there's a lot of people who are very VM savvy these days. 
um, and who can do that, right? I mean, I, you know, Ruckus does offer, um, it's called the Virtual Smart Zone, and it is a um, virtualized instance of our Smart Zone controller that can run on VMware or Microsoft Azure. Um, we'll be releasing it for Amazon shortly. Um, and if you are capable of running that, you know, I mean, as an, as an SE, I personally run um, a virtual smart zone on one of those Intel nukes, which is like a $500 computer the size of a cell phone, um, and that supports the three APs I have in my house, right? Because it's not, it doesn't take a lot of processing power to run it, um, but you do have to be, you know, fairly competent in being able to run a VM. Um, other than that, you know, it, it's it's pretty much like a physical controller. And what I, what I see, and and this is true for the for the higher end hardware controllers as well as virtualized controllers. Th these are companies that have their own cloud. They have an MPLS cloud across the country, and all of their sites are already connected into their corporate cloud. And so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a different definition of cloud based controller, right. but. It, 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 at the end of the day, it is a controller that's not local. Right, and it can move around, which is nice, right? You know, as a virtual con controller, you're no longer, you're no longer, you're no longer, you're no longer tied. You can motion it off to something else. Um, you know, you can set them up in a cluster format, just as you would expect something in the cloud to be set up. Um, right. So there's a lot of resiliency and redundancy built into that. Um, but as you say, you know, you got to have a virtualized infrastructure already set up. You know. Um, it, it seems very compelling because the software license is very inexpensive, but then when you think about the hardware that you have to have on the back end already configured and established to run it, um, you know, that's, so to our point on this particular slide, right, it's, it's we call it medium capex because theoretically the, the cost of the license isn't so much, but you do have to have hardware infrastructure to support it. And then low to medium opex because you know, theoretically, if you're running this in a data center that you already paid for and you already have a virtualized infrastructure, those lights were on anyway. So it, it's right. an incremental, you know, couple of pennies to run some extra CPU cycles for this virtualized appliance as well. Um, if you don't already have that environment and you need to build that out to be able to do this thing, then right. that could easily end up being, you know, a larger right. ongoing That's, cost. And, um, and, and, you know, that... that uh, uh, um, that almost seems like a good line of demarcation. If you have a virtualized environment, then absolutely a virtualized cloud controller is, is a definite potential option for you. Absolutely. If you don't have VM, uh, VMware or, or you're not running Linux servers, if, if you think, well, gosh, I can, just, I, can, I, I can get the hardware, build it out just to run a wireless network controller, that's probably not a good idea. Probably not the best idea, no. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, the one, we're trying to be agnostic, but the particular thing for Ruckus with this one um, is that because it's a virtualized uh, controller, it's a little bit of the best of both worlds, but we can't, we don't necessarily want to put it in the data plane with the traffic. And, in fact, um, we do have a model where we can. We have one called the virtual data plane, which actually allows you to terminate um, access point traffic on there and all user traffic will egress from that virtualized controller. But um, what I find is that um, usually people who want to terminate traffic on the virtual con or on a controller want that controller to exist in some DMZ type of a zone, right? If they're tunneling all that traffic back, it's because they want to do some data processing on that traffic. Unless right. you're an Amazon or a Facebook, and again, I mean, you know, other companies too, but unless you've already thought about that and you already have a virtualized infrastructure that is available in your demilitarized zone, you know, a lot of people set up a VM infrastructure, but they set that up as a server farm that's inside a firewall that's not exposed to anything that you're not going to be putting user data on unless they have to go through some kind of a firewall. So then the last place that you're going to want to tunnel all of this user data is going to be back onto that infrastructure that you just spent all this time and money protecting. Um, right. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both worlds. We certainly can do that, but you need to be aware that if that's the direction you want to go, you need to build out your virtual infrastructure in such a way where you will be able to effectively take use of that. Um, right. I know that's kind of a right. convoluted way to say it, but... 
So what we see, and I think it's I think it's it's clear, one size does not fit all. It, it, there's no there's no there's not necessarily one best way. Is cloud the best way? Is local hardware controller the best way? It, it depends. depends on and you don't want to make the wrong decision. That's correct. So so um, one of the first oh go ahead. No, I was gonna say I was just gonna start talking about this slide as you were about to. Um, yeah, this pretty much is what sums it up, right? Like knowing your customer, and by that it could also mean knowing yourself. You know, how many locations do you have? Are the interconnections gonna be private interconnections? Is it all gonna be publicly, you know, public inter internet connectivity anyway? Um, are are you a cloud friendly business? Meaning, is the majority of your work already being done on the internet, or are you a local file service business? You know, like if if the internet goes down and all of your users are effectively unable to perform their, their work functions, then you know maybe cloud isn't for you. Maybe you do need a local controller. Um, if on the other hand, you know um, the internet going down doesn't necessarily matter, then maybe it's not such a big deal. Um, and, and you know, two two thoughts. One, I, I so emphasize you, you you hit the nail on the head uh, talking about. Are you a cloud friendly? Are you cloud centric? The, the, one of the key questions is if if your user community is predominantly accessing local resources, local file servers, a local radius server, a local active directory server, and so forth, that's very different than if your end users are predominantly or, or exclusively accessing internet services. For example, hospitality. Somebody goes to a hotel room. <laughs> they're not accessing the server in the hotel. They're a guest in the hotel. They're, they're watching a movie on Netflix. They're checking email. They're going on the web. If a, if a contractor with a backhoe cuts the fiber going into that hotel and the internet connection goes down, well, the internet's down. Nobody could do anything doesn't matter what the status of the wireless network is at that point necessarily because even if the wireless network continued to operate the, the users couldn't do anything and 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 it goes back also to the to this if the wireless network can this is universal if the wireless network is in the cloud and the internet connection between the access point and the cloud controller is severed the network is going down, and and I, I talk about how you get three salespeople and one engineer, and they go out for coffee, and they come back with a marketing slick about cloud controller, and and oh well, you know, if you're connected to the network, you remain connected, which is which is generally true. If you are connected to a cloud-based control Wi-Fi network, and the internet connection goes down. You generally remain connected, but at that point, no, no one can associate. No one, no one can, no one new can connect to the network. And you can't roam. Anything that requires the access point reaching back to validate or confirm or authenticate you, it doesn't happen anymore. So one of the standard behaviors is for a, for a cloud-based access point. If the internet connection drops, the access point stops beaconing. Not universally true, but but it's at that level. So so you want to have in your mind that if accessing the wireless network is a critical part of your business, a critical part of your functioning, if you're cloud-based on the controller and the internet connection is cut, that network is on its way down, whether it's quickly or slowly. It, it, it cannot continue to function normally in the absence of an internet connection. Um, and, and when we raise the question, well, what about if I have a controller and the controller goes down? Well, you get a redundant controller if that's a concern. And, and many of our customers have redundant controllers. Many uh, corporate enterprise customers and school districts, too, they have redundant hardware controllers locally in their data center. <coughs> Very true. Did you do the same thing with the internet and have redundant internet connections? Yes. We have a few customers. Uh, they have uh, one of them has a Comcast and a Verizon 
connection. They, they're, they're through Comcast with a cable modem connection, and they're through Verizon with a DSL type of connection. Um, and you can buy an aggregator that uh, it's a box with 16 internet connections in it. You can have different providers. That's rare. That's a, not not many pe not many people in the big scheme of things. Not many people right. have redundant internet connections. A lot of people have unless you're doing some BGP peering or something. Yeah, I mean it's not going to be you're not going to be doing some kind of redundant internet connection unless it's your lifeblood, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, lots of people have redundant controllers, and usually, you know, I mean. I can speak for Ruckus. I don't know about anybody else, but I mean, we we deliberately price redundant controllers significantly, you know, at a significant discount because we want people's networks to stay on. You know, I would rather you spend a little bit of money rather than spending a, a lot of money, but then I get a lot more support calls. Um, you know, to to get it to stay on and to stay up. Um, so, it's redundancy is encouraged. And then the bullet point on capex versus opex. This goes back to what we talked about where you've got to do the math and you have to determine if you're considering cloud you have to determine the point at which the cost of the cloud equals the cost that you, the, the, the capex that you would have spent to put the controller online at the front end and you need to at least have that as something that you, you look at and maybe you go okay it's well worth it. it it's five years down the line and by that time who knows what I'm going to do uh, but at least it's something that you do want to look at. And underlying this, you want to look at features because not everybody needs every feature. Absolutely. And, and, and you look yeah. at a. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was going to say. I mean, as as you were saying, right? You know, I mean, whether it's you're doing traditional authentication or if you're going to do a pre-shared key, right? I mean, anybody can do a pre-shared key. Most everybody can do 802.1x as well, but how you're going to get that authentication through to your user database is something to take in advance, you know, uh, take into account. Are you going to want to do deep packet inspection? Is that something that's important to you? Um, and and, you that, would, and to... that and and deep packet inspection would imply that traffic is that all traffic is tunneled back to a central location where it can be inspected by a protocol analyzer. Right. I mean, you can, you know, Meraki and Ruckus and, and other people as well, you know, we can do some inspection at the AP, um, obviously. You know, we do, we do some higher level um, protocol analysis. But, you know, for true security analysis, as Joe says, you pretty much have to bring it back to a centralized location where you can have a dedicated device that does security analysis and do the security analysis on that traffic. Um, yes. And likewise, you know, mobile device onboarding, complexity of features, those are important things to take into account, right? Um, cloud cloud providers, I, I, 802.11k and R, right? Maybe you aren't familiar with neighbor lists and fast roaming. Um, maybe you don't need that. But I can tell you that as of today, um, I have yet to see 802.11k and R support on any cloud offering. Um, that's not to say that it won't be offered in the future, but if those are features that you require for your business today, that's going to set you on a particular path. Um, if they aren't features that you require or even know about, then maybe they're not as important to you. Exactly, um, and uh, that's so that's so fundamental. What what you're saying, Dave, that uh, th there are there are probably features in every cloud offering that aren't available. You may not need those features. On the other hand, there are definitely there are features that aren't available. The, the whole, the full gamut of features is not intended to be available in every cloud offering. So if there's a critical feature that you need, uh, you want to make sure you know you need it and then ascertain whether it's available in a cloud offering that you're considering. Absolutely. So what is the essence? What's the essence of what we're talking about? Know your network. That would be my yeah. that would be my essence. <laughs> yes, yes, and that's where where you find out when you know your network and you understand the the potential for cloud offering versus local local controller. That lets right. you decide whether a public cloud is a great potential. It could be really great, easy to use, cost effective, meets the requirements. Has has visibility over multiple locations. That could be a great thing. On the other hand, if if if, if 
access to the internet uh, uh, is is going to be the the thing that allows access to local resources. Maybe it's not so great. Right. Or if there are features that you need that you didn't know that you ne that you needed and they are not on offer from the particular vendor that you were looking at, you know that might not be so great. Right. Um, pr pretty much the the moral of my little spiel here is you know really ask right like you know as, as I mean I work for a hardware manufacturer but I'm the first to say that you know I I want my customers to be happy I don't want angry support calls so I'm really here to help advise people on what is going to work best in their environment you know and and as the non sales guy you know I'm, I'm the SE I'm not the sales guy which is great um, I'm able to talk about the tech rather than you know try to shoehorn something on to somebody. Um, so really it's about having a good relationship with your bars and having a good relationship with your hardware manufacturers and really asking questions and having them help you figure out what's going to work. Um, right. Right, and that's of course our role as customer facing uh, as, a, uh, as a reseller, as a design company, as an RF integrator. Uh, to help ask the right questions and, and understand what the right solution is. And I, I, I turn to the last two bullet points, and this is, this is really a, a go, no go. If the end user community absolutely depends on internet connectivity, then a cloud could be great. But if the business continuity depends on access to local resources, then realize that if, if internet connectivity to a cloud goes down, your network's on its way down. So cloud could be great. Cloud could be terrible. Well said, sir. So. So. Yeah, so a uh, first question that's come in is, can you talk a little bit more about 802.11k and R and what those are? Sure. Uh, so 802.11R is a standard for communication between access points to allow fast roaming. And Dave, you correct me if I go off the deep end here. Um, uh, if I'm connected to, if I'm associated to access point number one, and I walk down the hall, and now I'm going to associate to access point number two. Access point number two needs to know that I am authenticated to the network because it, 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 he's never seen you before and he doesn't know your MAC address. Before. Right. Absolutely the case. Know. You've authenticated AP1. Right. He doesn't know that You're I, describing it absolutely the case. Yes. He doesn't know that I walked down the hall. He just knows that suddenly I appeared. And now I'm trying to associate to access point number two. So he now has to go back through the internal radius authentication or active directory or however I was authenticated before, he has to go through and validate that I am allowed to authenticate to the network. And that takes time. Not a lot of time, but enough time to potentially be disruptive to a voice or voice and video call, which is really one of the drivers for, for uh, 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 preemptive Fast roaming transitions. Fast roaming. Absolutely. So 802.11R is a standard where the access points can communicate the authentication status of, of clients to adjacent access points so that when the client roams, the adjacent access point immediately knows without having to go through a, 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 a timely process. And timely, again, we're talking about 0.4 seconds or 0.6 seconds or something versus uh, uh, 20 milliseconds. Now, 802.11k, Dave, if you can elaborate on that. So it, sorry, the construction noise is getting louder at my house, so forgive me if I'm loud here. Um, so 802.11k is the client side of 802.11r. So 802.11r allows the APs to communicate and have a pre-cached copy of your credentials that have, uh, you know, and, and it could be, it doesn't have to be um, 802.1x, it could be pre-shared key, right? It knows that you've already authenticated against the controller, and so your MAC address and your IP address will just automatically be allowed on. Um, that's part of 802.11R. 802.11K is actually on the client side, and it tells the client, you know, if you're looking at this SSID, 
maintain a neighbor list of all the other APs that you see currently broadcasting that signal, what their MAC address is, and what their relative strength is. So that as I get to the edge of the coverage cell for my existing AP, I already have on my client an idea of where I want to roam off to. And as we all know, roaming is primarily done on the client side, right? The, there are mechanisms you can use on the infrastructure side to try to force a client to roam, but ultimately roaming is always a decision that the client makes because you know, short of de-offing someone, you're not really going to get them off of your radio and then you're giving them a really bad experience. Um, so 802.11k helps your client make a better choice about where he's going to go next. Um, and that works well with 802.11r because you've decided where you want to go and 802.11r has already told that guy that you're allowed to go there, so now you're just a lot, pretty much automatically allowed to join them. Does that, Joe, does that pretty yeah, non-technical yeah, exactly. response? Okay, cool. Exactly, and when, and, and uh, the, the next step in that overall discussion is to start talking about the packet level traffic that is impacted by K and R, because right. that's what it's doing. It's 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 minimizing the need to exchange different data, pa different management and control packets between the client, and the access point, and the authentication server. Uh, Correct. Uh, but but yes, so it's that, lessening that's your exactly. overall airtime for the migration, right? Or for the movement, exactly. Right? Keeping you off the air for longer. But but the flip side is, which is why it's probably not on offer. And I'm I'm an engineer, but I am not a Programmer, um, my under, you know, my assumption would be that there is a lot of chatter that goes on on 802.11r um, in the background because it's all very real time, right? The APs are are constantly making decisions about who's there, who's nearby, what APs need to be notified that this client might want to roam, and so I feel like perhaps that's left out of the cloud solution because with cloud, a lot of the APs are updating themselves every couple of minutes, right? Maybe it's every 30 seconds. Maybe they, they phone home every 30 seconds and they, they provide some type of metric or monitoring information, but they're not going to be phoning home every millisecond with updated 802.11r and k information for their neighbor APs. Um, right. So I feel like that might be why that's not on offer in terms of cloud. Um, <laughs> and, and likewise, you know, I, I use that as an example, but I'm sure that there are probably other data-intensive services that were I to say, like, Here's an apples to apples comparison of what you know Cisco has on offer for their controller versus what's on offer from the cloud, or even for Ruckus, what I have on offer for a smart zone versus what I'm going to be able to offer in the cloud when we roll that out. You know, I mean, I'm sure we're going to gradually grow, go towards feature parity, but at the same time, I'm sure that there are some things that it's just not, um, you know, a, not possible really to to pump out as much. Right. Right. Anita, are there other questions that came in? That's it, and we are at the bottom of the hour, so I think uh, this would be a good time to go ahead and do our wrap-up. Okay, well, great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said, the, the webinar uh, has been recorded. Uh, a link will be made available. Uh, uh, Anita, how is that link going to be made available? Right, so um, within the next 24 hours, you will receive an email uh, with a link to uh, to watch the recorded session. Fantastic. Great. And uh, again, Thanks so much for uh, your time today. Yeah, thank you. And at, from the Connect Data Two standpoint, we're at your service. Give us a call. We're we're happy to talk through uh, solutions that you're considering. So with that, I'll say farewell and have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. And yeah, have a great day. Thank you, Dave.